Hi, my name is Rasmus Pei. Welcome to this talk about cuckoo hatching. The outline of the talk is the following. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the origins of the idea behind cuckoo hashing. Uh, I'll explain how it works and why. Then I'll talk about some of the generalizations and extensions that people have made after 2001. I'll mention a couple of applications that go beyond hash tables or even data structures in cryptography. And finally, I will uh, mention some of the open problems that remain. The basic problem that we're considering is that of storing a set. And the type of queries that we're interested in is membership. So for some query element X, does X belong to the set A that is stored? And we're going to use an array for storing A. And the most basic thing you can do is to just store elements in arbitrary order. And whenever you need to look for X, you just search linearly through A in position one, two, three, and so on. And when you, if you find X, then you can stop. And we're also going to be assuming that whenever you find an empty slot, there's an invariant that says that, well, then X is not uh, present in the, in the table. Now it's possible to do much better than this. So already in the 1950s, researchers investigated what happens if you don't use the same search sequence for each element X, but rather for each element X, you choose a random position given by some function, hash function H1 of X, uh, that would tell you where to start searching for X. So you would first look at position, a, position H1 of X, then the next position and, and so on, um, until you either find X or an empty slot. And this already uh, gives a much better search speed, especially if H1 is chosen such that it behaves like a random function in this case, kind of the keys in the set will be distributed evenly across the table and you won't have to search very long on average. In the 1960s, a refinement of this was uh, explored that used not one, but two hash functions. So you would still start by looking at position H1 of X, then you would look at position H2 of X, another random position, and then you would proceed in an arithmetic progression. So you would kind of take the same step size again and again until you either find X or uh, an empty slot. And this works better in cases where the, this array is close to being full. In cuckoo hashing, we search only position H1 of X and H2 of X. So if X is in the set, it has to be in one of these two positions. So let's discuss when this is even possible. And I'm going to break up this array and think about its entries as nodes in a graph. So each uh, key that we insert has two possible positions given by the two hash values. And we can think about the choice of where to store the key as um, an orientation on, on this edge. In this case, there are two, two possible locations and the, the upper memory location is the one that we choose for, the, for this key. So in general, a state of cuckoo hashing is going to, or we can represent it like, like this. So we have a bunch of, of edges, each of them are, are oriented and we can only store one key in each memory location. So this means that we have to have such an orientation within degree one. So it turns out that such an orientation is possible if and only if each connected component is a tree plus maybe one more edge. So the connected component on the left you see actually has, has a cycle. That's not a problem. Um, but if you have a tree plus two edges, then actually you have more keys than you have locations. And then it's not possible to do an orientation within degree one. Now it turns out that if you keep the ratio between the number of edges and vertices strictly below one half, say less than 0 0.499, uh, then in a random graph, which is what we get if we use random hash functions, uh, we're going to have such an orientation with high probability. So that's nice. Of course, this doesn't explain how we find it. 
So this is basically what cuckoo hashing does. So suppose we want to uh, insert a new key, then we need to find a new orientation. And it may be that none of the locations that are possible for the new key are actually available. So now we take the cuckoo approach. So we have a new nested key and we place it by kicking out the current occupant. So for example, we may take the lower memory location here and say that the new key should go there. Of course, there was a key there already. So now we need to reorient the corresponding edge and move that key to the other possible location. So the key that was in that location needs to go to its alternative location and so on and so forth. It may happen that we actually return to a location that we were visited before. Then we are going to start undoing some of the reorientations that we did until finally we find a free spot. If this uh, procedure loops, we rehash with new hash functions. But as I said, this happens only with very small probability. So this is cuckoo hashing. So a very simple greedy way of maintaining this kind of in degree one orientation. What about the insertion time? Well, uh, it depends on the size of the component in, in this random graph. And under the same condition as before, that the graph is not too dense, the expected size of a component, connected component is, is going to be uh, constant. So this is kind of the basic cuckoo hashing that we published in 2001. And later on, uh, many authors have looked at various kinds of generalizations and extensions. So the most obvious one maybe is to use more hash functions. So let D, which is at least two, be the number of hash functions. Then the, we stop studying random graphs and start study, study, studying random hypergraphs. We can also look at allowing more than one key per bucket. Then we start studying not in degree one orientations, but so-called K orientations. And both of these modifications turn out to allow a higher load thresholds. That is the, the fraction of, of, of the hash table that is full becomes closer to one. We can also look at variants that copy each key, uh, some number C of times. And this is something that is aimed at achieving higher redundancy. And I'm going to give an example of an application of that later on. Then there's the issue of the hash functions. So what I said uh, so far was the, on the assumption of some very strong hash functions, but it turns out actually that very simple form of hashing and also efficient called tabulation hashing actually probably works with cuckoo hashing. Now, there's also, also been several works on de uh, the data structure and giving high probability bounds such that all uh, operations work with high probability in constant time. This uses ideas such as queues and stashes and so-called backyards. Next, I'm going to talk about a couple of applications that are outside of the realm of data structures. So consider the case where Alice and Bob both have an element from some set. Alice has the element A, Bob has the element B, and they might wonder if they have the same element. But they also don't want to the other party to tell us anything about their element in case they are different. So there are cryptographic protocols, I'm not, I'm not going to describe them, where both parties learn exactly the intersection of, of their singleton sets without learning anything else. So if they don't have the same element, they don't learn anything about the, the element of, of the other party. Now, in private set intersection, we would like to generalize this to the case where Alice has a set, Bob has a set, and both parties should learn the intersection of the two sets. So this is the goal. And there's a trivial reduction that just runs the singleton protocol for every pair of, of elements. Um, and this, of course, requires size of A times size of B runs of the singleton protocol. Cuckoo hashing gives a more efficient reduction. So there are several ways of doing it, but one is to take three hash functions with two copies of each element. 
Alice builds a cuckoo hash table where she places each element in, in A in two out of the three possible locations. And Bob does the same thing. And now we can observe that it suffices to actually run the singleton protocol on uh, each pair of elements that are in the same location. And we are guaranteed that any element that exists in both sets is going to be stored in the same location in both of these hash tables. So this reduces the number of runs of the singleton protocol from uh, quadratic to, to linear in the total size of the set. Another application is oblivious RAM. So it's easy to observe that cuckoo hashing has the property that when you look up uh, some key X, uh, what you are doing from the point of view of the, of the memory is to access a random pair of memory location H, H1 of X and H2 of X. In the cryptography world, there's a concept called oblivious RAM, which basically is a way to protect someone observing the memory addresses you uh, access from uh, learning anything about the information that you, that you access. So in an oblivious RAM, you want any sequence of dictionary reads and writes to give the same distribution of, of memory accesses. And now you can, you can see that this is obviously a much stronger um, requirement, but nevertheless, it turns out that there are clever reductions that build on top of cuckoo hashing to build oblivious RAMs. Finally, let me discuss some open problems. One of the main open problems that has been, that people have thought about since 2001, so it might be difficult, is to find uh, efficient hash function for cuckoo hashing that can be stored in a constant number of machine words. We know that it suffices with login-wise independent hash functions, but of course, this requires login machine words in general to store such a function. We also know that five independent hash functions are not sufficient. It's still possible that maybe six independents or some constant independence is enough, or that could be an entirely different construction that, that gives such a result. Another open problem is, is about the insertion procedure for when you have more than two hash functions. In that case, you have a, a choice when you kick out a, a key where to move it to. And a natural choice is to randomly choose one of the other, other neighbors. So that's the so-called random walk insertion procedure. Empirically, it works very well. So if the load factor, so the fraction of, of keys in the table is alpha, um, and this is bounded away from one, empirically you get constant time. But the best known provable bound for this is polylogarithmic in, in N. So closing this gap would be great. A less studied open problem might be load factor threshold with multiple copies. So for example, um, the case where there are three hash functions, two keys per bucket, and two copies of each key, uh, as far as I know, is, is, is not well understood. And this, these particular parameters are I've chosen because it seems empirically that they could actually lead to better protocols for private set intersection than the one I, I showed on the previous slide. And finally, and this is something that builds on recent developments in so-called peelable hyper graphs, is to understand what happens if we go beyond uniformly random hyper edges. So can it help to choose edges from some other distribution where somehow these hash functions are not independent, but somehow correlated. And in particular, uh, it would be interesting to see if this can be somehow exploited in the dynamic setting. So I'd like to end by thanking the Test of Time Award Committee, Rizvik, Samir Kula, and Edith Cohen for their kind citation. I would like to thank my co-author, Fleming Frigge and all other co-authors that helped me investigate the world of hashing algorithms. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks also to 
all the researchers who did cool follow-up work that I could uh, talk about now. And thank you all for listening to this talk. <laughs>